Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. May the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us as we celebrate Fourth Sunday in Advent. George. The fourth Sunday of Advent, we praise you, O God, for this wheel of time that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, open our eyes to see your presence in the lowly ones of this earth. Enlighten us with your grace that we may sing of your Advent among us in the word made flesh. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. With your great might, give us your help, that whatever is hindered by our sins may be speedily accomplished by your grace. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's first reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. When the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant Dayton, David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from the following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from Romans chapter 16, beginning with verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Captive Israel, 
that moans in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save. And give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits bind thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadow put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou Lord, O Lord of might, who to thy tribes on Sinai's height in ancient times didst give the law in cloud and majesty. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Thank you, George. Thank you, Tom. We'll continue with the gospel lesson for this fourth Sunday in Advent, which is taken from the gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have been found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of the father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born and will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it, me, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we so appreciate, and that's such a weak word, we so enjoy and we are so thankful for all the efforts that you have made to come to us and be there for us and with us. As we celebrate this fourth Sunday of Advent, may it be a Sunday that is looking not only forward to the joy of receiving and giving gifts, but the time to remember that you are our God and that we are your people. In your name we pray, amen. One of the realities in scripture is that if we begin in the beginning and end in the end, there's a big gap and a gap that is constantly described. For example, in Genesis 3, we have the fall and there is nothing that man has done or can do to eradicate that. We've tried, we try all sorts of social methods even today to bring the word of God to the people of God, but we always seemingly have a sense of, of not only at times shame, but we also have a sense of incompetence where we're not able to do the things that we want to do. There's a bridge, the longest bridge in the world is the Danzang Bridge in China. It's 102.4 miles. Can you imagine that? A bridge of 102.4 miles. It's as far as, and this is for the sake of George and others who have the desire to cheer for the University of Michigan, it's as far from here as from here to the big house in Ann Arbor. So I don't know why anyone would want to traverse that kind of gap, but... Uh, it, is, it gives us some kind of a feeling how big the gap is. And it is really big, and, but the reality that we have to face is that there is no way that we can really transverse that part. We can be able to, to, do, to catch up and, and move from here to Ann Arbor. That may be a gap, but it's nowhere near the gap that has existed between us and God since the fall of man as recorded in the third chapter of Genesis. The fall that we have experienced and do experience on a daily basis is a reality that we cannot just sort of uh, slide over. We can't just sort of uh, forget about it with a few nice words. No, it's a fall that has set us up to a point where we must acknowledge, if we're honest with ourselves, that the sin is too much for us to overcome. Now, in Scripture, we not only have the fall, but we have something else, and that is we have Jesus Christ. He chose people. He chose people all the way through Scripture. People are chosen by God to work with him as in partnership to overcome this gap of sin that is so real and so, uh, uh, so difficult to deal with. And so when we are recognize that we have been chosen to work with him, we should probably look a little bit more closely what it means to be chosen. We have the notion in most of the things that we do that choice is made on the basis of our merits. The choice is made on the basis by God that he looks at our merits, he looks at what we've done, he looks at our capabilities and abilities, and he says, that's the one I want. I don't know whether you as uh, men, when you were young, young boys, ever did this, but uh, we chose teams for baseball, and you usually had the baseball bat, and you sort of moved up to see where you could get to the top. 
And what was interesting is that I always lost <laughs> because I, I didn't know how to play baseball. People didn't want me on their, on their team. But the whole notion of being chosen for the merits that we have is erroneous in Scripture because God chooses us because of not of who he, we are, but of who he is. And that's the important point for us to acknowledge. It's important for us to remember that God chooses us not because we are in favor alone, but think with me for a moment about the word favor. We have a tendency to think, oh, we're favored because of what we are and who we are and what we can, what we can do. But scripture uses the word favor. Remember, O favored one, the angel said to, the, to uh, Mary, O favored one. And we can capture the meaning of that, O favored one, when we recognize that in both in Hebrew and in Greek, favored one is based upon grace. It's grace that is, that is manifested and, and discussed in this first chapter of Luke. So Mary was a favored one because of the grace of God, not because of anything that she did, not even because she was a virgin. And all the way through scripture, the people that are chosen are usually chosen from the lowest socioeconomic, lowest, lowest socioeconomic level in our society. Again and again, we find people that you and I wouldn't choose we, would, we wouldn't choose, certainly, not even Israel, although it's incredible how, how powerful a small country like Israel can be. But we have people like David. He was just a shepherd kid. People like the shepherds themselves. The shepherds were outcasts in society. They weren't you know, marvelous people as we have dressed them up in our Sunday services and Christmas services. The shepherds were people who were not capable of really getting a good job, and so they, le they were left with the poorest job, which was to be there with sheep. Now, finally, if we can't do what we need to do in order to overcome this gap, then what, or who can, not what, but who can? And that's why we have to turn to Jesus. And the proclamation is, let me read it to you again. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. If there's anything that we should remember during the remainder of this Advent season, is that we have a God for whom nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. When you hear the message that nothing is too hard for God, how do you respond? Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.